Hello and welcome to the first ever Risk Averse. Now, if you know me, you may be wondering, Hannah, did you seriously start an entire online poetry night just because you came up with one good pun? And you would be partly right. But I also have several other reasons for starting this project. You've seen the little intro that I made and the logo. It's all a bit tongue in cheek, but this is a serious situation and I don't want to make light of it at all. But what I do want to do is provide a bit of light distraction, a bit of poetry for people who are missing their monthly poetry nights and a platform for poets who have had sets canceled and things like that because of coronavirus. Also more selfishly, I just want something to keep me busy because I've been on my own about two and a half months and I'm going slightly crazy. So here I am, uh, sitting in between my uh, fridge and my freezer. I've tried to make it look like it's a desk. Uh, there's also this big mark on the wall which you probably noticed, I, I can't fix that. There's also this stain behind me which I've tried to wipe off but it's not budging so I have been trying to kind of cover it with my body unsuccessfully. Uh, but we're making do. This is all about making do. And to clarify, this is not a poetry night about quarantine, it's just a poetry night during quarantine, and it may continue when we're out of quarantine, who knows. Some of the poets may touch on coronavirus with their words, not physically, but they'll also do poems about a whole range of other things, because inequalities and mental health issues and love and friendship, none of the things that we write about have stopped, if anything, they're heightened and it's important that we keep talking about those things as well. So this is how it's going to work. For this episode, I'm going to introduce three feature poets to you, uh, one after the other in no particular order, and they've all filmed themselves doing a 15 minute set. Now, at this point, I'm going to awkwardly raise the topic of money. Uh, at a normal poetry night, you might expect to pay somewhere between three and 10 pounds. Obviously, this is not the same, uh, it's much shorter, the poets haven't had to spend money on travel, but they have put a lot of time and effort into their sets still, and I would love to be able to pay them if at all possible. Uh, so by the time this uh, video goes up, I will have made some sort of crowdfunder. Uh, if you could donate to that, 100% of the money will be split evenly between the three poets, and I would massively appreciate that. But of course, a lot of people are very strapped for cash right now, so Absolutely no worries if you can't donate. Don't feel guilty, please still enjoy the video. But if you could give this a share, that would be amazing uh, because I would just love as many people as possible to see these poets uh, and their fantastic work. So I think that's my opening spiel done. So without further ado, I will introduce the first ever Risk Averse feature. Angela Innes has a degree in crime scenes and spooky things and is currently a master's researcher in sexuality and gender. Alongside this, she performs poems about what ties our daydreams and nightmares together, writing about topics such as sexuality, heartbreak and empowerment. In 2018, she wrote for Always' End Period Poverty campaign, and in 2019, she performed political slam poems for TEDx South Wales. Most recently, she competed as part of the University of Birmingham Unislam team, who were finalists in 2020. As well as being a great friend, Angela is one of the hardest working writers I know, and she manages to find beauty and tragedy in just everyday moments that I might have overlooked. I would really recommend checking out her Instagram and YouTube because she's always producing really high quality, thoughtful, insightful content that she strives to make as accessible as possible. So you will see Angela perform in just a few moments, but first of all, I've got to explain something. I was trying to contact Angela, but she just wasn't replying to my messages. So I had to get a bit creative and I sent a little delivery to her door. I am Angela Innes and I am a poet and student at Birmingham University and I am going to read you some poems. I just wanted to say thank you to Hannah for having me on Risk Averse, the first one, very exciting. Um, and yeah, let's get straight into it. So I recently took part in Escape Rule, which is a poetry event um, where poets 
can write a poem every day for the whole month of April. It started with the prompt dawn and finished with the prompt dusk and unbeknownst to me I managed to link them up. I only realised when I read them both back <laughs> that they actually were both fairly similar. Um, so I'm going to read both of them to you. This poem is Dawn. Sweat gathers in the creases of my eyelids, wet in the cracks and hot as it breaks through the window. And I cannot find my legs again. They are somewhere in this bed, right where I left them last night. I do this each morning, aching, Sharp corners of alarms and acids left on overnight, biting and pulling, but I am alone. Now I am truly alone and it feels like dawn. My bed is mine now and not mine because it's yours and therefore I am allowed. It's mine and my skin feels like sunlight with none of the magic white, hot and painful to stare at because I am not yours to touch or glare at. I am alone and it feels like dawn. That was dawn and this is dusk. How was your day, my darling? Did you watch the dust settle through my gaze? Did you see how I painted blush across our cheeks, how my hands met yours to relish in the warmth together? I know you daydreamed about me, lost in the trail of sweat down my chest, like water caught on your lip that sticks to the side of a glass. You wish for more time with me, I know. I can see it in how you look away. You turn your face as if I don't make your eyes water, Skin hot enough it could blister. I'll reflect in watch faces as dusk arrives. Golden. You feel your most beautiful and I get to see you bask in it. As my grip slips and I retreat over peaks, I will tell you how I enjoyed our time together. Until I arrive. Warm through your eyelids again. So yeah, they, um... They match up on that last line and I didn't realise I was doing it, <laughs> so that was quite satisfying. As everyone who is writing in lockdown, I've written a couple of quarantine poems, um, both of which are along the same theme of wanting to go on a date uh, and not being able to. So the first is about a cliché scene I saw in a TV programme where the couple I like taking photos in a photo booth and have their first kiss. So this is about that. It's only ever shoes challenging me, sticking out from underneath the curtain. I wouldn't mind sharing the air with you. The slot machine of cancer in Venus dreams and sitting so close our shoulders ask if this is kissing. First. Just a smile. It's as though I can feel the breeze from your eyelashes as the bulb catches you off guard. Flash. Sound booth laughter haunts the shop floor inside the wall pushes us closer. Haggling like schoolgirl shoves to persuade. Flash. Your hand finds my waist and I hope these three seconds last forever. Or try hard to count each finger pressed to me and breath I forget to take deep. Flash. The smell of sickly sweet cow parsley in mosquito heat summer's springs to mind. It's also close and you smile at my lips. And our bodies don't have to ask anymore. Flash. So that was the first of the two I've written in lockdown. <laughs> um, and this is the second. This heat feels different. Grass blade sparkles and the peach fuzz blanket holds space for sore cheeks. Seek the crow's feet, laughing at childhood's memories. Nose scrunches or eye rolls to cast away our tripped words all while mindless fingertips pass across new skin. 
Our noses touch and smudge glitter to yours like strawberry seeds between teeth. Tonight I can hear the soundtrack to it all. There's no breathe or underbreath date declarations. It's voice notes and late night wind chime of an iPhone keyboard. It's laughing to my walls and hoping it echoes so loud. It drowns out my rules of not daydreaming about you. So yeah. So yes, they are both bittersweet quarantine poems. So the next is a poem I wrote for the prompt Earthly Pleasures. Um, I don't quite know where it went with it, but it's about realising that you're pretty alright by yourself. So this is Earthly Pleasures. One. Perhaps I don't want to hold you. You've made it too much like a game which I am always losing, catching snowflakes on my tongue while it's hailing, nursing a split lip warmth from leaky radiators won't fix. 2. Autumn came and Welsh wind with it. Every bitter chill that made them suck their lips against teeth caused my eyes to water. I crossed over the front of my coat and walked to you, met you lingering on the corner always ignoring the red chillblains breathing fire through my fingers. 3. You actually wrapped your arms around me, and I wondered if something awful was going to happen. Left me grinning at a bonfire, petrol can in hand, watching the cinders of a bridge I crossed to get here, scream, and then whistle. 4. Running fingers through hair felt too similar to ripping up grass when you've been made to sit for too long. So you re -turfed. but it looks a little yellow to me. Unearthed reasons to be written into sand being greeted by the sea. The equinox is supposed to be hopeful, so I will plant a garden and want for buttercups to grow. It's okay if they don't. Just knowing they are somewhere else, golden, that is enough. There was dirt under my nails and dust across my shins as a child. Hooking toes into bark and reaching for leaves was when I felt strong and like nothing could touch me. I might just start climbing trees again. There was a selection of poems I wrote, um, which are all thematically similar, and they're all about toxic or abusive relationships, so the next three poems are content warning for those things. Um, but the first is for the prompt, Bearing Fruit. I never understood men's tastes, so I let them tell me what sugar tasted like, dressed like, thought like. I let them pick from a menu that someone later pointed out as my personality. He taught me to always cut the white bits off peppers because it tastes bad. He also said he hated cooking but always criticised my food. Boys will drink bitter until they are supposed to enjoy it but won't eat bitter unless it does it to them first or stops asking altogether. We used to pass love hearts between us, but I can't eat them anymore. No matter how much I want something sickly sweet. My friends used to tally how many times he talked about children in one pub trip. He'd regard me as if my body was a dirt patch, there to bear any fruit he wanted to grow. He cooked me meals four days in a row, but in the end pulled the tablecloth out from underneath everything before I could take the first bite. I see everyone baking bread as respite, cooking themselves into food, but I finally like myself enough to be pushed around, kneaded into something to be torn apart, and e eaten alive by somebody who says they care. The next two are list poems um, that I wrote 
The first is this. The following is a list of things that make me flinch. The snap of wound up tea towels, ice clinking against my teeth, a glint of light through stained glass, police sirens, empty beer bottles against countertop, my ringtone, good girl, trains passing platforms, doctor's slips, my therapist's laugh, wax strips, compliments, crunch of popcorn kernels, our bathroom's hot tap, thinking of things I should have said, the fact I stayed instead. And the second of the list poems is this. The following is a list of things I learnt from the silent treatment. Sometimes your heart can beat loud enough you'll hear it. Being shouted at is relieving. Some people can sleep on an unresolved argument peacefully. How to recognise a set jaw. To cry quietly. Soft can be weaponized. Who has a spare room? What to cook when two people are eating but only one of them is talking. They'll listen harder. Not to answer your phone. How quickly you can relive a day in your mind to check for mistakes. To feel sick and still function. You'll always say sorry first. You won't ever know what you're saying sorry for. They are the three sad ones because what's a poetry set without sad poems? I thought I would finish off on a cheerier one. So this poem is about the first time I almost kissed a girl. I chickened out, but I almost did it. And it goes like this. To the girl I almost kissed. In that unlit club, all strobe lights and music I knew the words to blaring, and love I did not know, it's all dancing in front of me. Know that I was a coward, so afraid of my own history, of my past fumbling, because I have never done this before. Never dislodged this brick and brought the wall caving in, red dust powdering our skin, sticking to sweat, hot, persistent, need wet, and not what I've ever allowed myself. Blushed and wanting and so afraid of what is on the other side of this lust, I feel fifteen again. My palms slip against stone, questioning, am I ready and how do I do this, but what is right is steady and learning. But I am here instead. And you are so alive and beautiful and not what I've known before. And so I don't kiss you. Unacquainted fear overcomes and with music pounding, I do not kiss you, but you hold my hand. My cheeks are the colour of brick, blood on thorns, fire, engine red, and for every time I was called queer and flinched away from the words, stirred the letters into cement, built up bricks around this part of me, fixed and never revisited. Until now, I succumb to your touch. Your gold rings on the fingertips flushed against my silver and... All the times my skins shone green, seen Mother Nature fall hard for herself, watched every couple under never-ending blue skies, pride blossoming like violets and vines under my skin, indigo veins bubbling with everything I have never known. In the lamplight, I should have kissed you. A director's cut coming of age, a little late arm around waist, hand in hair, kiss. Let this wall crumble, just from your touch. Pressed your skin against mine and I would have felt it crushed. Stone to dirty street, teeth to lip and it would have been everything. So thank you so much for listening and watching my poetry. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on Instagram and YouTube and thank you so much again to Hannah and Risk Averse for having me all of the other poets on this lineup are wonderful um, so yes, I hope you're keeping well and enjoying poetry thanks for having me thank you so much Angela, that was a magical set now I'll go straight into introducing our second feature poet, who is Dami Ohiria. Dami is currently a medical student at the University of Sheffield, writing and performing poetry whenever possible. She is the co-founder and former host of the monthly open mic night All Mic Long in Sheffield. 
She is a Say Out Slam champion, Slam of the North 2019 winner, and first runner up of Unislam 2020. She is a member of the feminist art collective in Sheffield, Verse Matters. She writes about everyday experiences and silly things that shouldn't happen. Her poetry sometimes touches on public health issues because she's a medic and won't let you forget it. That's her words, not mine. She also enjoys baking. You can find her on Facebook and Twitter at Dami Poetry. I first met Dami at Unislam a couple of years ago and I was just blown away by her. She manages to both educate and entertain with her work, which is a really difficult thing to do. She has this microscopic eye for detail, but she can also capture a kaleidoscopic range of emotions all within one piece, and it's so impressive. I cannot wait for you to see her work. So you will hear from Dami very shortly, but first I just got to explain that again, I had some issues contacting her right before my housemate left to go move in with their parents. They went a bit crazy and microwaved our Wi-Fi router. So, I had to get creative. I constructed the world's most aerodynamic paper aeroplane and threw it out my window. Oh, what's this? Oh, Hannah, do some poems. <laughs> I'll get my book. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining in and watching these sets. Massive thank you to Hannah as well for asking me to do this. I hope everyone is managing to stay at home and stay safe and stay entertained as well during this time. So the first poem I'm going to do is called The Name Poem. It's a poem about names. Um, so my name is Dami, D-A-M-I. Um, and I write poems. And sometimes I write poems about names when people don't get mine right. So here's name, hope you enjoy. If your name is Ayomiti Dele, my joy has come home. Say it from your gut, because when your mother was naming you, she meant it. Perhaps your name is Shakondria, from the root Shaka, meaning great Zulu warrior. Say it with your chest. Your grandmother picked it to stand out from the rest. See, if your name is Reese, with an H-Y-S, Welsh, meaning passion, feeling, fire, it really sets you apart. When your dad chose it, he felt it in his heart. And if your name is Rogelio, renowned soldier, roll your R with all your tongue, because it's so damn sexy when you say it correctly. Now, if your name is Sean and he tries to call you Sean, tell him, Paul, that's not my name at all. And please, if your name is Shegun, don't introduce yourself as Segan, because I know that's not what your mama says when she sees you. Now, since my name is Danny, if you try to call me Demi or Danny, firstly, I'll correct you. And then I'll write a poem about it. Because when I introduce myself, I don't stutter. It'd be really interesting if I stuttered there. Make it a bit more spicy. Okay. <laughs> um, so as Hannah said, I am a medical student. So often poems I write um, touch on my experience of and in healthcare. Um, this particular poem I wrote after a period of time where I found myself holding hands with patients quite a bit. Um, and I've been thinking about it a lot more recently because obviously physical touch can be quite reassuring sometimes. But obviously we're in a, in a time um, where we can't do that as much and we have to keep our distance. Um, so yeah, just, just a reflection on that period that period of time, not this period of time, you know, back then when I could hold people's hands. Um, yeah, it doesn't really have a name yet, but it's, it's about holding hands, so perhaps we'll call it that, holding hands. Here we go. I guess it makes sense that the first hand I held was my father's. Fresh from my mother, they handed me across, 
still damp and white all over. There was safety there for me, for him too, a clasp to confirm I survived the journey. As far as memory goes, the next few hands I remember holding were siblings, mostly crossing busy Lagos roads to church or school or neighbors' houses, usually from mom's car, from safety to safety. I remember the first time I felt uncomfortable holding a hand. It was my sister's. We were crossing a road in Wales. I didn't register why. I just felt the eyes and felt uneasy, so I let go. We crossed side by side. Still safe, but less secure. I've got a friend who holds hands of friends he holds dear. Discusses hand-holding techniques and asks what you prefer. Whether he means it to or not, it says to me, you're safe here. This unashamed display of friendship. Recently, I found myself holding hands with semi-strangers. It's the strangest of things, sharing these intimate moments with people who are nervous, alone, or afraid of the unknown, reaching out for safety. In the hands of a med student, inappropriately smiling because she's not sure what else to do. Often, it's when I'm the most useful. I'm just here, offering warmth, and the illusion of safety. Both of us, hand in hand, a little more sure, we're in the right place. Okay. This next poem um, I wrote after our first day back um, in January, after a set of rather stressful exams that we'd had in, in December, um, it's called We Cry. I recently learned something new. It's the first day of term and our lecturer sets out a poll. It asks how often we have cried in the last six months. There are four options. I discreetly select my answer, thankful, it's anonymous. Two minutes later, the results flash up and in this chamber, it turns out the secret is my colleagues are no different. We are one when it comes to this, as I learn that 95% of my teammates have cried for a total of three weeks worth of hours in the last six months. I see that I am not alone, that we have all felt the same intense pressure, the same desire to do our best, for our best to be more than good enough, even when it gets so tough striving to do no harm to anyone except ourselves sometimes. I remember that it's okay to cry when it feels like you just can't do another day like this, that sometimes duvet days are required to mop up salty cheeks with shit shows on Netflix and cheap pomme bear crisps. I make a mental note to look, like really look at my colleagues and see them. I make a pact to ask, to make dinner plans where we can unpack. I make a pact to recognise when I need that helping hand. I make a pact to reach out. Because see, it's so easily missed. That carers need care, that we need to share this burden we shoulder sometimes. In a world where resources are scarce and falls to us, to take on these simple but mighty tasks, to look out for each other. Remember to ask, please, just ask, and never take fine for an answer. Okay, so <clears throat> this next poem is around sort of diversity in medicine, because um, we need lots of different kinds of doctors to be able to help lots of different kinds of patients. Um, yeah, so here we have the unexpected. <clears throat> For some, Dr. Dawodu has a weird sounding name and makes them feel uncomfortable. But for her, he's relatable. She feels listened to. 
For him, Dr. Day means empowerment, his health in his hands, but for others, that's a bit too modern. I didn't go to medical schools. Don't ask me how to solve this problem, see? There are reasons our NHS needs to be diverse. For like, when you come back from Madagascar with that unique rash. Dr. Jones, in his 25 years, hasn't had much time for travel. The clinical handbook knows the facts, but Dr. Dash knows firsthand. She's your best chance. Perhaps in male or female, you've never found home. Dr. Hemsworth is non-binary. They kind of understand. See, our NHS should leave no one feeling alone. Diversity needs to be our backbone. Not forgetting those coming after us. A wise person once said, you can't be what you can't see. So we need to display the diversity in our society. Black, white, woman, non-binary, from families with signet rings and house crests to those with no fineries. 18 and bright-eyed or 35 with laugh lines, the NHS is for you. We need to show that anyone can take this mantle. It's never too late to pick up this mantle. We need to dismantle this myth of what a medical student looks like or what a junior doctor looks like or what a consultant looks like. Because hopefully in my lifetime, I will be all of those things. Me, proudly Nigerian born and Cardiff raised, but won't talk about how low my school ranked or the, or the kids in the back setting things ablaze. You, perhaps differently abled, no trust fund, didn't do university the first time around. We, the unexpected, are what the NHS looks like. Okay, so that's it for my book. Um, this next poem I wrote as like sort of a reply to someone saying that medics can't write poetry, because I'm a medic who writes poetry. Um, and I'm not the only one, there are lots, there are tons um, of people from all different, lots of different walks of life who write poetry. Um, and that's the beauty of it. Um, so this next one is just, medics can't write poetry. A creative writing professor recently proclaimed, medics can't write poetry. Presumably because all we know is prose, haven't assimilated alliteration, and Lord knows my punctuation will leave you reaching. For headache pills, because that was a full stop where there should have been a coma. I guess my spelling isn't great either, but medics can't write poetry. Who made this rule, please? Because I don't remember it. And I still remember lecture one. It was how not to get struck off. Though our names were yet to dance along the GMC register, here was a reminder that the General Medical Council can end you, anytime. There to hang you out to dry when you buckled under the pressure of one too many late nights and blurry eyes. Longer than any NHS waiting list, here's just some of the things you can't do. Now you've taken on this endless shift. You cannot enter any social gathering without announcing valiantly that yes, in fact, I am a medic. I could save your life. But please don't ask me to. But please don't ask me to, because it's only been two weeks and I haven't even been signed off for hand washing. You cannot post those pictures on Facebook. You just can't. You cannot be friends with your patients. You can't attend their graduations, christenings, weddings. And yes, while it is thanks to you that Paul can use his penis again, you definitely can't be there for the next time he does. And when he says, by the way, I found this lump. And actually, it kind of hurts. Will you notice it? The hesitation. You see, perhaps I don't need to sit and learn punctuation to see that life itself is punctuated with these moments that require us to fully stop and just be there in them. So yeah, when a patient's family wants a chat, you be there, no matter how long it lasts. But you cannot bring people back to life, no matter how hard you try. And you definitely 
cannot care less no matter how much it hurts see there are lots of things medics can't do poetry i hope remains within the realms of possibility on this unwritten list of things medics can't do i pray i never see poetry what use is a stethoscope if no one can hear what's in my heart. So that's it from me today. Thank you so much um, for being here and spending this time with me. Um, it's been great. If you've liked anything I've said or talked about today, please follow my page on Facebook. It's simply Dami, D-A-M-I. We learned how to spell it at the beginning. Um, Dami Poetry. Um, and if you'd like to hear more of my stuff, some stuff that's not um, medicine related as well. I do cover other topics. Um, please follow my page on Facebook and keep up to date with the things that I do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dami. Uh, do go check her out on all of her platforms. Now that leads us to our third and final poet of the episode, of the night, of the event, of this thing, uh, Alex Clark. Alex Clark is a poet and medical student who says they have a lot of free time now that the doctors are too overwhelmed to teach. They've been filling it by writing as much poetry as possible. Their work focuses on love, childhood and what it means to be an adult at the wizened age of 22. I have been so impressed by Alex's work ever since I met them at a poetry slam in Edinburgh. They were too modest to admit it in that bio but Alex has won a lot of slams and I think part of it is due to their knack for juggling sincerity and humour. Unfortunately, my string of bad luck regarding contacting poets continued when a possessed doll stole my phone. Oh my god! Fortunately, because Alex and I are both Scottish, we have a telepathic connection, so I just contacted them with my mind. Hey, Alex. Hey Hannah, what's up? Could you do some poems right now? Yeah, I'm not busy. Ah, perfect. Thanks so much. So it feels a little bit strange to be filming poetry in my childhood bedroom, but here we are in lockdown. Um, and this first poem I actually wrote in lockdown, it was the poem I wrote on the first day of Napo Remo, National Poetry Writing Month, where you write a poem every day in April. Um, I lasted one day. And this is the result. And it's um, a po poem about the fact that the world has gone mad um, and that things are really difficult. But I have been incredibly lucky for the past year to have been working with a wonderful therapist and f on the NHS. And we love the NHS, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But, um, you know, when you're really ill, you think of therapy as this magical future cure-all. Um, and it's not, though it can be wonderful um and i was just there in april thinking about the fact that you know things were going on both personally and worldwide that i may not be cured but i was coping just so much i was coping with so much more and with so much more ease than i ever would have before starting work so it's called sisyphus and it's about therapy there's a waiting list for Sisyphus's garden, 20 times the length of his hill. I sat outside his pearly gate, made friends with Pete, poor man, doomed to bear bad news. And now I've been here nearly a year pushing the bloody boulder. I haven't reached the hilltop I imagined, but my arms are finally strong. So yeah, just a short one to start with, uh, but speaking of loving the NHS, I've got another little short one um, that is about being in training to work for the NHS. And I am one of the many, many people who is in training, um, who is not quite old enough to be one of the medics or nurses brought up to the front line, something I'm both frustrated by, but largely grateful for, because the, you know, as much as I'd as much as we all want to contribute, it's a terrifying prospect and the, you know, the work everyone's doing is incredible and we're all trying to help out behind the scenes in little ways, as I'm sure everyone else is in their own ways. 
But this poem I wrote a couple of years ago, so when I was even less ready um, for the front line um, about being a student. Um, and yeah, it's it just speaks for itself. It's called Taking Blood. The swordsman sits, tight chest, tight lips, preparing his blade to puncture, penetrate. This might hurt a little. A junior physician, a fencer feared, a foil tray to place his pay when the bout is over and blood has spilled. One wish blood shall not spill, and tears neither simple procedure, sword, syringe, scowling consultant. Do no harm, do no harm, do no harm. So those are the two sort of shorter, more pagey poems, um, and now I'm getting into a bit of spoken word, but this one is also actually about training for the NHS, though it was written in my more academic days when there was less stabbing of veins and more writing of essays. Um, it's actually the very first spoken word poem I ever wrote, wrote it all the way back in 2016, but it's still it's still one I like to bring out every so often today, um, and it's called Bovine. Love of mine, partner in crime slower of time and thoughts and worlds, can you hear the thrumming of my heart a mile a minute it's speeding down the highway to hell and it is not fast enough so help me darling sweetie sugar pie sugar free fill my throat with bubbles and my stomach with butterflies i love the way you taste do you know the things you do to me turn me on turn me up taurine caffeine living through a fever dream flood me with your sweetness and keep me going all night long red bull this is your love song I've got far too many essays due, so yeah, I'm crawling back to you. I said last week that we were through, but you know well, and I do too, that passion is a volatile thing, explosive, like a shaken tin, and when we come together, baby, it's like mentos and coke erupting in my arteries, except with less minty freshness and more miserable exhaustion. Is your name a deliberate metaphor for self-destruction? Am I both beast and matador, loading myself, goading myself up on your delicious poison? Or if you're the bull, am I the china shop? I want you to wreck me, wreak your havoc from my insides out. You tear me apart, you nasty thing. And I know you've been questioning my faithfulness, cheating husband, unloyal customer. I know you know about the monster in my bed, that I've gotten a taste for rock stars and pussy, but we never discuss exclusivity, and sometimes I feel like you're just with me for my money anyway, you know, my mother warned me not to get involved with you, and sometimes I wish I'd listened. But our petty quarrels, lovers' quarrels, will still be there in the morning. Can't we just have tonight? Let me lie with you, put my lips to you, let me dance with you until the watery dawn of deadlines and flatlines and panting palpitations. Please, please, give me wings. Speaking of unhealthy coping mechanisms, um, this next poem is called Sobriety. Um, I can't even remember when I wrote it now, but I do know it's one of my favourite poems to perform with a drink in hand many years later, um, as it's all water or, I suppose, beer under the bridge. I'm kind of pissed I never got to hit rock bottom. Like, I put the wetsuit on, sailed out to sea, tied an anchor around my feet, but before I could plunge into the watery deeps, I chose to change tack, stepped back. It's not that I wanted to be down in a gutter, spluttering up stomach and battery acid by which I mean Sainsbury's own brand vodka, the sort of state you might see in a TV special when my vessel hit the rapids. I didn't want to drown. It's just 
Steering the SS sobriety through these rocky waters warrants a drive that's often derived from survival instinct. And now, on the brink of something awful, I reckon I ought to be a little less resentful if I'd had a more eventful experience of addiction. Because even if I had fallen off the sea wagon, I'm not sure I'd packed on enough weight to sink. To me, drink felt more like treading water. Tiring requiring more effort than most just to stay afloat, but I wasn't exactly snorting salt, gasping for air as Davy Jones dragged me down to his nautical lair, and now that I'm finally standing on dry land, my feet in the sand are scratched by hot grains, the pain mixed with a strange taste metallic tang from biting my tongue to maintain this ban, and the heat is beating down on me. I am teetotal, but teetering on the edge of testing just how well I swim again. Like maybe this time I'll sprout gills at the bottom of a whiskey glass. Instead, I'm plodding along. No knots for me, but those in my stomach. I am floating in an ocean of my own apathy. What path for me is there? What meetings can I attend to explain that I'm pained by my lack of worry? No flurry of sympathy is coming my way if I stood up at AA with intent to say something like, Hi. I'm Alex. I guess I'm just scared. In the interest of keeping things a little bit more positive for the next few minutes, uh, this next one is a poem I don't perform very often, though I'm not sure why. Um, and it's entitled A Sheepish Defence of Polyamory. Listening to someone with my hair extol the virtues of polyamory is kind of the poetry night equivalent of listening to a man with a top knot and a receding hairline tell you you're just not appreciating the genius of Quentin Tarantino. But I'm here, and I'm doing it, because I've got something to say. What is up with monogamy? I'm not judging. To me, monogamy is like heterosexuality. Bizarre confusing and unpleasant sounding, but you guys do you. I have a straight friend. I'm just here to fly the flag for love without hierarchy, and I'm getting awfully bored with fielding questions from Glaka onlookers too busy gawking to Google, so allow me to dispel some myths. Polyamory doesn't mean I can't commit. It means I'm willing to commit three times. Polyamory is not a bloke with five wives. I am not a Mormon, though I find it ironic that every missionary in the meadows is hot enough to make me want to sin. Polyamory doesn't mean that I'm a slut. Wanting to fuck every Mormon in the meadows means that I'm a slut. It doesn't mean that I feel no jealousy. I'm unpleasantly struck by it more often than I often admit. It means I don't consider it anyone's problem but mine. It means my boyfriend likes to be wined and dined, and my girlfriend likes to woo. And I like both. And both of them like making new partners like you like making friends. Means loving more people isn't loving each less. My love is growing with each new minute. My love is magic and it's fucking infinite. My love is not fossil fuel running out fast. My love's solar peppered and it's gonna last. Uh I do want to thank everybody for their patience with me because I don't own a tripod or anything to stop me from shaking the camera, uh, particularly for this final poem, which is one I often like to end on um, and that I particularly like to do live because then you can't think that I've um, edited the video somehow, but um, I do need my hands for it, so I am now genuinely holding my phone with my feet. Uh, but this is a love letter to healthy coping mechanisms um, and it's one of my favourite poems to perform. I never liked breathing exercises much. Like if I'm trying to calm down, reminding myself of the thin flapping sacks stretching and filling like water balloons about to burst that are the only things standing between me and death, it's not the way I'm gonna do it. Like I get the theory. Say I've gotten into a panic, a little bit manic, too much, much too rushed expiration, depletion of my ration of the gas we think of as waste, but which takes up an important physiological space, stopping the base bicarbonate, not of soda, but bubbling in a similar way from forming a blood-based monopoly, making the stuff that's pumping far too quickly around my veins a bit basic. Not basic, like simple and overdone, though I'm aware this poem might fall on that spectrum, but basic like the opposite of acidic. 
like pH, like PS, the exacerbation of this mess is my hyperventilation. Because if I breathe out too much, the blood gets too basic, the head gets light and the eyes start to glaze. It means the rest of my body gets increasingly tainted because I didn't breathe right. And now I've fainted. But if I get more CO2, the antidote brushing against my skin and out my mouth with the rest of this hot air, it dissolves in the blood and makes it more acidic. This is a good thing, but thinking about deliberately turning my blood to acid does not calm me down. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm a bit high strung. And while getting mellow on any kind of gas, be it CO2 or something more illicit, does not elicit any interest from me, apparently I still need something to make me chill the fuck out. Enter the cube. He's a stocky wee thing, colourful in dress if not personality. Personally, I find him a bit rigid, stiff in his positions and not one to cut corners, but when I'm in a tight spot, nerves shot. He's a sweet companion. He clicks as he moves softly, like a nervous babysitter soothing a teething toddler, and it pisses off people on trains, but I like it. He moves smoothly, mostly, gets stuck every so often, but don't we all? And his edges feel solid beneath my fingers. I sit in my conversation with him, a back and forth that sometimes feels like going around in circles, but which has a rhythmic patter, a banter I enjoy. And I know, the image I'm presenting is not one of a particularly fun person. I play with a Rubik's Cube and people wonder if I'm on my fourth or fifth pure maths degree. Search for my account on incels.me, but I hate numbers and I don't hate women. I just like my cube. I like that he gives me something to do with my hands, somewhere to put them that isn't around my own throat when fidget spinners are out of vogue and a cigarette doesn't seem worth it. I like that the colours are pretty and that it's a sweet kid's toy and sometimes it's nice to float in the innocence we've all had to leave behind. More than anything, I like that it's a game I get to win a hundred times a day, where nobody loses because only I play. And I like it because sometimes it's nice to remember. The things I mess up, I can put back together. Thank you very much for listening and thank you to Hannah for organising this. It's an absolutely wonderful idea. We all need poetry in, in times like these. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Alex, for rounding off this strange project. You didn't even know you were going to go last, but you did a great job. I will just mention the crowdfunder thingy one more time. Uh, it will be in the link below, the description below. I don't know. So if you can donate, amazing. If you can share, that's just as appreciated. Also, this is very much a work in progress. I do plan on making another one of these, but it might not be exactly the same. I was thinking it would be cool to somehow incorporate an open mic, but I don't fully know how that's going to work yet. So if you have any ideas, please do let me know. One possibility is that people could send in short clips of them performing a single poem, which I can I could then intersperse between the feature acts. Let me know if you think that would be a good idea or if you would prefer there just to be features uh, every episode. Thank you so much to you for watching and thank you so much to the poets for agreeing to these shenanigans. I think all that's left to say now is I hope you risk a verse and that you be risk averse? Yeah, I think I need a better catchphrase.